So, <clears throat> Danish people are the happiest people on this planet. According to several international happiness surveys, most recently one from the renowned University of Cambridge, we Danes are happier and have a greater sense of general well-being than anyone else on the planet. Interestingly, whenever Danes are presented with this, they go, huh? Or what? Or who did these people talk to? Because it wasn't me. And our immediate academic response was to set up some type of scientific task force claiming, uh, we're going to prove you wrong because we're not happy at all. And they came up with an explanation saying, oh, it's not that we're so happy really, it's just that we don't have very great expectations. <laughs> we're not happy, we just don't expect very much in life, that's why you mistake us for being happy. <laughs> I don't think that's it. I think that we Danes are happier because we don't pretend much. Now, I study behavior. I'm a biologist and a researcher, and very early on in my scientific career, I set out on a quest because the common tendency, the common understanding within the natural sciences is that consciousness is the sum of cognitive processes taking place in our brains, that my experience of my feeling, what philosophers term qualia, solely belong in the humanities and in the arts, and that our social interactions that we all engage in have nothing to do with our biology whatsoever. So, I created a new field of research. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> I created this field of research, industrial ethology. Uh, ethology is the specific term for the study of behavior. And uh, the core purpose of this field is to investigate the biology of social relations. So, um, I think we're all familiar with what it feels like when we walk into a room and someone is very aggressive. All of a sudden you're confronted with this aggression. And it immediately, you, it's, you catch it immediately, it's somehow contagious. You either become aggressive yourself and feel like shouting back or you become scared or want to run away or something like that. And you can feel your heart pounding and there's this sensation that your stomach sort of ties itself together and your pulse raises. And I was like, what's up with that? This is so much my biology responding. What's happening here? So I set out to measure that. And um, in collaboration with Irma, a Danish retail chain I, um, who bought my research project, I, um, I sort of created an experiment to see if we could somehow measure how uh, feelings are contagious and how moods are transmitted in a social context or in social interactions. So, I designed the experiments to take place in the stores, in the supermarkets, during opening hour, in the most archetypal situations that everyone know of. For instance, a person sits in the counter and there's a line of customers. And um, what we did was uh, measure three different types of mood. We had the really rude, aggressive, totally unpolite customers. We had the totally neutral, everyday-like customers and the overwhelmingly kind and pleasant, really, really nice customers. And everyone um, involved in this scenario at the same time, person in the counter and the line of customer, we would hook up with halter monitors that measure your heart rate variability and your pulse, and we would film them from all kinds of different angles in order to be able to make analysis of their face, uh, facial expression and their postures. And um, the purpose of which, of course, was to measure uh, something, something that had to do with their emotional state, their physiological state, and also their behavioral state while they were engaging in these interactions to see if we could detect where is this transmission going on. And um, I, my hypothesis and my ex sincere expectation was that there would be some sort of linearity. So you have a person sitting in the counter and there's this customer coming up and customers like being overly aggressive and you would have uh, 
the person in the counter would there would be some sort of spillover to the person in the counters. You would be, uh, you do your job much better and make sure that I don't have to waste my time here. And then the person in the counter would be, oh, you, me, me, me. And on the other hand, of course, I also expected that uh, when this very kind and pleasant customer would come up and sort of be heartwarming and sharing, it would immediately spill over so that we would be able to detect this uh, in, in the person sitting in the counter. And, and I also expected that that um, the line of customer probably it would dilute a bit, but they would also somehow catch the contagion of the particular emotional state of mind. None of that showed, however. None of that showed at all. Instead, we had um, a scenario where a really rude and aggressive customer comes in, and if the person in the counter has this... Uh, uh, what an annoying loser, I'm just doing my job, type of attitude, then um, we could detect no, uh, way, no energy, extra energy, spare energy spent in his system whatsoever, no detection of the emotional state that, would it, that it would spill over, no detection of um, this aggression that I thought, you know, you know, the pulse rises and the heart starts pounding, all of that, we weren't able to detect any of that. But, on the other hand, if we had that this very rude customer would come in and the person in the counter would do her job, as she's trained to do, having an attitude or pulling on an attitude, the customer is always right. Then her system would become maximal stressed. Maximal stressed. And this is not just the customer is always right. This is also the boss or manager is always right. And the teacher is always right. And the parent is always right. Even the wife is always right. But in our household, that's not stressful. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, um, so this is, to me, this is the most surprising finding of a biology of authenticity. If you behave or respond to any type of, of social encounter with your systemic impulse, then there's no stress in your system, even though you may catch the emotional state. Your system doesn't need to do anything about it because you're behaving with the systemic impulse. If, however, you filter your response and you do what you're trained to do in a situation like that, the customer is always right, then it's more stressful than anything else we could measure or detect in any of these scenarios. Hmm. So, to maintain this non-filtered response is to sort of serve the general um, systemic well-being that I think we can call happiness. So th does this mean that every time this person in the counter goes to do his job, he needs to just immediately shout back at any rude customer coming up because otherwise he'll be stressed at work and can't have that? See, that wasn't a very good situation. And fortunately, it's not like that. Um, we have, we share biology and our biologies are extremely plastic it's always possible to change patterns it's always possible to relearn strategies for instance we develop tools based on very basic stuff like breathing techniques relaxation programs awareness training that can help you rearrange strategies not become stressful in situations even though you maintain a systemic resp response and not becoming uh, rude, like what an annoying loser, but just becoming neutral. So, going back to the theme of this TEDx event, I came to think about how my American friends always come back to me with some sort of interested complaint about how Danes are not really very service-minded and that they're somewhat rude. And if, if you go out shopping or you go out eating in restaurants, people are like, not quite living up to the standards of service that you acquire as a customer. And I came to think that perhaps it's not that Danes are more rude than anyone else, but probably we are a little more authentic. Hmm. And um, I began contemplating what could be the precursors of this particular state of mind. How can this be that we perhaps are more authentic Happier people, more authentic people. And 
Well, we have this very strong history of social grouping, of equalities, of equal rights, equal possibilities, and of tolerance. Tolerance. This means that you're allowed to be who you are, and you're also accepted by society as who you are to a very great extent. Even if you belong to a minority, you're accepted by society. Even if you're totally weird, you may be accepted by society. There's this spaciousness that allows us to be who we are. Authentic. And if this is really it, if this is why Danes come out first as the happiest people on this planet, then this is not just an idea worth spreading. Then I believe that this heritage of tolerance, of plurality, of multitude and acceptance is a gift worth sharing. This is something that we have to offer into the pool, the great pool of change that we long to see in this world. An expertise of inner sustainability. That we, because we know it so well, we may define it much easier here than elsewhere in the world. And of course we can help refine it as well. And focus upon all the advantages it is to add this to our common well-being, the greater well-being of our common global society, not just for other people, but also for the animals and the planet we share. And this is, I think, the take-home message from my little talk. Stay authentic. Be true to your nature, to your biology. Be true to who you are. Because then you don't need to expect very much. You have so much already. And then there's no need to pretend. Thank you. <laughs>